No power, no problem. Today we're gonna dive into oxyfuel welding, one of the oldest forms of welding there is. Let's dive in. This is an oxyacetylene torch, and most people would say it's kind of an outdated form of welding to be using today with machines and processes like MIG and TIG and even stick. But it still has a lot to teach us about making a puddle, moving that puddle, and adding filler, and that's exactly what we're going to dive into today. This is the rig that I have for the house. It is the G150 from Victor. It's the portable tote and it comes with everything you need. It comes with the torch body, multiple torch attachments, such as this number two welding tip or a zero brazing tip. And then we also have a cutting attachment with various different tip sizes. We also have our striker. It comes with all the hose that you need. We've got our regulators here. We've got our tanks here but they can't ship it out there with oxygen and acetylene in there for pretty obvious reasons. That would be kind of a risk, but they ship them out and you have bottles. And if it's anything like my local distributor, when I go there, they just exchange them for you. So you just say, I just need to exchange my little bottles and they'll take care of the rest usually. Once I've swapped out for some fresh gas, we can get set up to weld. First, I'm gonna attach my oxygen regulator Make sure when you're tightening down these bolts, you're not using things like these pliers because that can go to strip your bolts. Instead, you want to use something like a crescent wrench or a wrench that's the exact size you need. Next, I'm going to attach the acetylene regulator. You can tell this one specifically for your acetylene because of the notch in the nut. Now let's go ahead and attach our welding tip here, we're going to just screw it down and I'm not going to use any tools because that can actually strip those threads in there. So we just want to make sure we get it nice and snug with our hands. Now that we have everything we need, let's talk about how this works. We're going to set different pressures with these dials on our regulators here. Today, I'm going to be using one to maybe three PSI of acetylene and on our oxygen, we're going to be going about 10 PSI. We don't want to exceed 15 PSI when we're working with acetylene. It can become unstable and blow up. Acetylene is a little bit of a tricky gas to work with because it's kind of temperamental. Keep that in mind. In this torch body, we have our two connections here. See the red for our fuel, green for our oxygen. And each of these knobs up here, these control that gas flow to the tip here. When these two gases mix and burn at a certain ratio, it'll raise the temperature up to close to 3,100 degrees Celsius. That is, it's a lot hotter in Fahrenheit, but I don't know the conversion. So <laughs> let us know down in the comments. But before we could go any further, we definitely got to talk about the proper way to light your torch. So let's dive in. To first light your torch, you're going to want to follow these following steps. On the torch right here, we are going to want to make sure we open up both of our gas valves just like that. And just open those gas valves and then close them back up. First step. I'm going to go ahead and just crack that open to set that pressure. I'm going to open my oxygen line while I crank down our regulator until we get up to 10 PSI. Now I can close that down. Remember, we said don't exceed 15 PSI. I'm shooting for just about one PSI of acetylene when I'm welding. We've got our valve closed on this side. Also on our acetylene tank here, we're going to just open one small turn on our acetylene. Now we're going to open our line again and we are going to crank down until we just barely start getting any gas out there. There we go. We are set. Looks like we've got about three PSI on our acetylene right now. We're going around 10 for our oxygen. Let's go about lighting it. Before you light that torch, you should put on some PPE. Just saying. Always a good practice to have something covering your arms to avoid getting burned. And I'm rocking this sweet up and smoke jacket that I got at Clash of the Grinders, which season two is finally out. Out now. You can check it out on 3M Abrasive's YouTube channel down in the description. And considering we're gonna be working with a hot flame, 
I have my game changer gloves from Blue Demon to protect my hands. And to protect my eyes, I have these shades from Bomber, which actually have a T5 shade in them, which is going to be the minimum shade you want when you're oxyfuel welding. Another option are these goggles that come with the actual kit. First thing we want to do when we are lighting an oxygen acetylene torch is we're going to turn on our gas just barely, right? Take our striker, not our Bic lighter. We're going to light that. See all that black? That's actually carbon being burnt off of the acetylene. And then we just crack on our oxygen and you can see when we start adding our oxygen in, see that little blue tail. It's hard to see here, but like it's a little sharp point. That's what we are going to be using to actually do our welding. And to shut down, I'm going to turn my air off. Got my gas there. Then I like to just give it a little. There you go. When we're working with an oxy fuel torch, we have three types of flames that we can be using. We have a carburized flame, which means there's a lot more carbon in it or more acetylene is being used and burned. Oxidized, which means that we have more oxygen than fuel going. And then we have this flame, which is a neutral flame. This is what we're shooting for. This is a pretty good mixture. We're kind of even on the gas, even on the oxygen side. If you're trying to figure out more uses for the different types of flames, check out this podcast that I did with John Henderson from ESOB and Victor Torches, going over everything you need to know about oxyacetylene welding and cutting. For the sake of today's video, we're sticking to a neutral flame. Now that we've got down how to light a torch, let's see what it looks like to make a puddle. As we use this flame to heat up the metal, it makes something called a reduction zone, which helps to clean the metal. The closer I get that flame to the metal, the quicker it's going to heat up and vice versa, the further away, the longer it'll take. But as we see the puddle form, it goes from a glowing orange to a metallic yellow in my opinion. Now, if we want to move that puddle, we'll have to move the heat. Now, as we start moving, you'll see the shape of your puddle will go from a circle to more of an oval. And if you move too fast, the heat won't have enough time to break down the metal fast enough, leaving you with an inconsistent bead. Now that we have an idea of what we need to be looking for in a puddle, let's talk about adding filler to it. Today for my filler, I'm going to be using a regular ER70-S2 TIG wire. It's not the wire we really want for this. The correct rod that you're going to want to use is an RG45, but I didn't have any on hand and people used to do it with wire hangers, so I thought this was the closest thing I had. We want to hold our filler in our left hand and introduce it to the edge of our puddle. I'm a very, very shaky dude and I guess I need to cut back on the coffee, but we we're going to want to add that filler and then let it soak in. So each time I move forward, I'm going to be adding filler to keep our bead the same size, but let it soak in before moving forward and adding another dab. If it looks like I'm getting too hot, what I'm going to want to do is increase the distance of my torch from the plate so we cool it off. And vice versa, if it looks like it's not hot enough, we just get a little bit closer. That's how we're going to want to control the size of our bead and try to keep it consistent as we're moving across the plate. Another thing you might run into while you're practicing is a dirty welding tip, as you can see here. That sharp tip that we had before is no longer there because we have some sort of dross buildup either on the tip or in the tip. So if you see your flame looking like this, it's time to give it a good clean. Now, let's talk about welding two pieces of metal together. I went ahead and got these pieces of 18 gauge carbon steel sheet metal pieces prepped to see what it looks like to run a basic butt weld. First, I'll need to tack the two sides. Then we want to get our puddle started. And when we see it drop, as my good friend Austin Hargett says, we're off to the races. 
Again, just like before, we're moving forward and adding our filler, but we want to make sure we're seeing both pieces of metal melting. What you want to look for is something called a keyhole, which is going to be right in front of your puddle, which is just where you can see both pieces of the metal melting away. And that ensures that you're getting fusion to the root of the two pieces of metal. Funny enough, is right near the end of this, I thought I was about to burn through, but was finally actually getting full penetration. I'm no expert when it comes to doing this, but I tried over and over and over to get some penetration. And finally, at one point, I got some, but it wasn't pretty. But this is what it looks like when you get penetration on the backside. To see a better example of this, here's Man Cub from a few years back showing you what a good example of this is. I will admit that this is probably not the most effective way of doing things these days, but it sure is fun and it teaches you a lot about moving a puddle and how to control your heat with your torch distance. So if you're a TIG welder, definitely have something to check out. I will admit this is a little bit trickier than MIG or TIG or stick in my opinion just because it's so new to me. But if you are trying to learn more about oxyfuel cutting, check out this awesome guide we have from Jason Becker. It has everything you need to get up and going and cutting like a champ. Until next time, we'll see you out there. And that's exactly, oh man, okay. This is an, 